Welcome to MOOC course on Introduction to Proteogenomics. In the last lecture, Dr. Carl Clausler introduced you to the basics of mass spectrometry based proteomics. Today's lecture will focus on the crucial steps in sample preparation for mass spectrometry based proteomics and also to provide a glimpse of label based quantitative proteomic approaches. Further, the concepts of peptide spectrum match or PSMs and spectrum library matching will be covered. So, let us welcome Dr. Clauser for his second lecture. Extra things and that might be possible to use in, uh, in reducing your list to the confidently assigned uh, peptides. Okay. Uh, some scoring systems are going to be, but we're almost never these days going to collect one MS spectrum at a time. We're going to stick it in a machine and the machine's going to go and go uh, generating mass spectra uh, as, as long as it can. All right. So you start out uh, with, to make that automated workflow happen, you're going to start out with uh, a source of material, which could be tissue, could be cell lines. Uh, you're going to extract that uh, into proteins then we most often will digest the proteins into peptides. The peptides then go into a mass spectrometer and then this automated uh, system does three basic steps. Okay? It's going to separate the peptides chromatographically, eluding them over time uh, based on their hydrophobicity. And so this, in this uh, description here, that, that run time takes about 120 minutes. Okay? At some given point in time, a scan is going to happen. This takes about uh, 10, 10 to 100 milliseconds now. Uh, the first thing you would do in, in a cycle is take an MS scan. You'll measure the masses of all of the peptides that are present. And then you will uh, very quickly collect some number of MS, MS spectrum. A common number to do now is 10. So, it, and it will take the 10 biggest things that was observed in this MS scan and do MS-MS on them, okay? Today, this, a cycle like this can happen in a second, okay? All right, and then all, this huge collection of spectra that are generated automatically then will get put into a software program uh, and it will try to match up uh, assign peptide sequences to each of the mass spectra, and then you'll have uh, some additional software that'll try to take the peptides that belong to the same protein, and you get out a list of proteins that were observed and all of the peptides that uh, you've observed with those. Okay. This is one of the, uh, the I want to say most desirable instrument, but that it's most desirable only if you can afford it. It's one of the uh, most expensive instruments, and it can do a whole lot of things. Okay, uh, the the CPTAC program is currently generating uh, almost all of its data on this kind of an instrument, but we don't use the entire capability of the instrument. Okay, so this uh, instrument, uh, a, a fusion Lumos from Thermo, you put ions in here. You then uh, have uh, a way of isolating precursor ions here, and then you can do MSMS by three different techniques. You can do something called high, high energy, higher, ener higher energy collision dissociation. You can do collision-induced dissociation, or you can do electron transfer dissociation. Okay, uh, and then you measure things, uh, the spectra in the orbit trap. It's also possible to measure them in the in the ion trap out here at lower resolution. You can go faster uh, with lower resolution if you go out here, okay? In practice, in the CPTAC program for generating proteogenomic data, we, gen we generate only HCD spectra and we collect mass spectra only in the orbit trap, okay? So we're not taking full advantage of the instrument. Uh, the reason we're using those instruments is because this instrument, which does only the things that we really want to, didn't become available till just earlier in this year, and we uh, started uh, the grants that we were doing a year before that. Okay, all right. So this I think of as today the workhorse uh, type of instrument that if one was setting up a lab to do proteogenomics in the way that we are going to describe having done it in the um, CPTAC program, this this instrument would be the uh, one that one would get uh, today. Sample preparation. Okay, so. Uh, in proteomics, these are some of the basic uh, considerations that you have to do in designing your experiment. Okay? We're quite often going to start with um, 
uh, either cells, tissue, fluid, the fluid might be blood for example, uh, and then there's going to be some set of separations that we're going to choose to do, okay. You have the choice uh, of maybe you want to do some fractionation at the protein level, you might want to do some enrichment or depletion at the protein level. If you're working on cells and you care about mitochondria, you might do a preparation that gives you an enrichment of that subcellular fraction uh, that you're interested in, okay. From the standpoint of, of proteogenomics, we don't do any fractionation at the protein level, okay. The first thing we do is digestion to peptides and then it's all about separation of peptides after that, okay. If you're going to do set fractionation at the protein level, it's usually because you're after some particular subset of things or it, let's say you're doing um, uh, plasma. Plasma, the most abundant protein in plasma is albumin, right, and it's the least interesting protein, but it's a, so what the first thing you want to do is get rid of it, okay. So you use a depletion step to get rid of albumin before you go to peptides, right. But for the purpose of look, doing cancer uh, proteogenomics, we take our tissue, grind it up, go to peptides, and then we're going to fractionate peptides. Uh, typically if you're going to, if you're going to do it offline before you go to the instrument, what you want to do is choose a methodology that's going to give you a different kind of separation than the one that's going into the instrument. So two common ways of doing that are either ion exchange or what we uh, most commonly do now which is basic reverse phase, okay. So that means we're running a reverse phase separation but we run it at pH 10, okay. The uh, separation that uh, goes into the instrument goes at pH 3, okay. The, another thing that you want to, uh, want to do is uh, enrichment, okay. So if you're after phosphopeptides, you don't have to sequence everything else uh, to get to your phosphopeptides, so you use uh, something to pull them out. We use a mobilized metal affinity uh, chromatography. Uh, if you're interested in uh, lysine acetylated peptides, you can uh, isolate them with an anti-acetyllysine antibody, okay. All right, so in choosing what you want to do, you're looking to make a trade-off among these criteria. Okay. All right. Uh, most proteomics today is done in a, in a way where we're, there's going to be a digestion step to peptides, okay. Trypsin is by far the most common enzyme uh, to use uh, and it gives you uh, convenient lengths of peptides that are uh, generally tend to work well in a mass spectrometer. They have the property that they have a basic uh, amino acid uh, at the C terminus. Uh, which is going to give you somewhat better fragmentation than, than if it's not uh, at the C terminus, okay. Cysteines um, can be disulfide linked when they're in a protein. If you just reduce them, they're very hard to chemically uh, maintain throughout your process. So what we uh, typically do is reduce the, break the disulfide bonds and then alkylate them with some uh, agent like iodoacetamide. Uh, that then makes them readily detectable, okay. All right. Uh, so uh, when you're doing enrichment, uh, here you want to think about whether you're doing enrichment or depletion uh, at the protein level uh, here. Uh, then there would be a digestion step uh, and then uh, consider fractionation or affinity enrichment. The, the reason that you would make all of these kinds of strategic decisions is probably with some goal of increasing your depth of coverage. So if you want to start out with a complex sample and you're only interested in these things that are low abundance, there's going to be typically some form of infinity enrichment uh, involved or depletion of more abundant uh, components, all right. All right, uh, so the ones uh, that are the most common uh, post-translational modifications that are, that uh, people can work on that are uh, do by large scale. Uh, methods, phosphorylation of course is, is the most uh, significant one. Uh, in our lab we also do a lot of ubiquitination work. Um, this happens, by, uh, this is done by uh, having a glycine glycine which is the, uh, starts out on the ubiquitin. So the ubiquitin is uh, covalently bonded to a lysine in a protein. When you treat it with uh, trypsin, it cuts off the ubiquitin but leaves two glycines that were the C terminus of the ubiquitin, okay. Acetylated lysines are something else that we also now are doing routinely in the CPTAC program, okay. So uh, and you can do these by using an anti-acetyl lysine antibody, 
All right. So we also uh, have done this in a way where we don't have to split up the sample and, and uh, lose, require more sample and then dedicate only some of it to one modification, only some of it to another, and so, some of it to a third. Instead, we do the enrichments one after the other. Okay? So the supernatant uh, of what comes through a uh, IMAC column can then be used uh, to, so the things that don't bind to the IMAC column come through. You can then do a next step of enrichment uh, for something else. And, and in our case, we can do, we've published uh, work on doing those three things uh, in, in serial. Okay, so you'd start with less total sample and, and achieve all, each of those items. All right. Uh, okay, quantitation and multiplexing. The, almost anything that, that we do in our lab today in proteomics and, and quite a lot of labs are trying to do things that are quantitative. Okay, and the basics, basis of doing something quantitative uh, and having some statistical power requires that you have replicates, okay? So not only do you want to have replicates, but you typically want to compare two conditions, at least two conditions. And examples of this might include uh, wild type versus mutant expression, treatment with a drug or without a drug, or capturing something uh, uh, with a bait or, or not. And then most of what you detect is probably going to be unchanged between the conditions and you're looking to do statistics to recognize some subset of things uh, which change between the conditions that you do. Okay? All right. What sort of experimental design considerations should you put into this? Okay? I'm going to show you three different techniques. One here is called uh, label-free where you, uh, you basically combine the samples at the end. Okay, and then I'm going to show you two labeled techniques. One is SILAC, stable isotope uh, labeling of amino acids in cell culture. And then uh, the third one is something uh, called uh, a TMT or ITRAC, where you're using a chemical labeling agent. You then are going to combine the samples and then put them into a mass spectrometer. The, you do MSMS. The quantitation comes at the level of the MSMS -MS spectrum. Okay. In this technique here, you combine earlier in the process, and the quantitation comes at the MS level. Okay. Multiplexing-wise, you can do three things, uh, three, three samples at a time, pictured or only two. Okay. You can do light and heavy. Okay. The third one would be medium. Okay. All right. Uh, with a TMT-10 reagent, you can put together 10 samples. If you have an ITRAC reagent, uh, there's actually two ITRAC reagents. One's called ITRAC-4 and the other one's called ITRAC-8. Okay, so that tells you how many samples you can put together. There's also something called TMT-6, okay? And I will get f into uh, some of the, the differences in what you have to have to be able to do those kinds of experiments, okay? So here are some of the features about this. Um, it takes a lot more time to do an experiment this way a lot more instrument time. Uh, here, there is uh, some uh, loss of accuracy in the quantitation due to compression that I'll talk to you about. The reagents uh, are, can be expensive. Okay. All right. Here, you have uh, less potential to do plexing. And in order to get a heavy label, you have to be able to add that to the uh, to the cell culture that, that is uh, going on. So that means you can't label humans, okay? So you can, uh, this, is really, this is really suited to working with uh, cells in cell culture, okay? All right, uh, and uh, the, the quality of the uh, quantitation uh, is shown here and uh, would be highest over here, okay? Why is it highest over there, okay? Ideally, when you're going to mix things together, you'd like to mix them as early in the process as possible so that any of the experimental variable, uh, variable variability that happens happens to all the samples together, okay? But because of the way you do the experiment, uh, you can't necessarily mix things until a later stage, okay? So in the case of chemical labeling, you have to mix after you have done digestion, 
But if you do it in cell culture, you get it and, and uh, do the combination way back when they, uh, just after the cells have grown, okay? All right, and so I think I've already said some of the pros and cons about this. So let's uh, move on. All right, and let's go straight to what happens when you do a chemical labeling approach, okay? So the idea here is this, you might, uh, here I'm illustrating TMT6, okay? So you would have six samples. You lyse each of those uh, uh, the samples. That gives you proteins. Then you reduce and alkylate trips and digest the peptides. <coughs> After you have peptides, you use the TMT labeling agent. The, these are uh, amine chemistry-based uh, reagents, so they're going to put a label on the side chain of lysine and on the end terminus of the peptide. Okay, and so the the uh, reagent normally comes in six colors. Okay. The, the, these are actually masses, and the, the masses shown here are the reporter ion masses that are present in the MSMS -MS spectrum, okay? So then after you do the labeling, you mix the samples, and then uh, you have six different things labeled. The purpose of doing it this way is you, the labeling reagent causes all of the samples to have the same mass, okay? And the label is going to have a different mass, but only after you do MSMS, okay? So the signal that you see in an MS1 scan is the sum of all of the six samples, okay? Uh, which is good, right? It means in, you, you get more signal when you combine the samples, okay? And then after you fragment, you're gonna have uh, the reporter ions that allow you to get the peak height that is shown here is gonna enable you to do the quantitation back to the samples that they came from. All right. This is the chemical structure of the label, right? And sh shown where the asterisks are uh, is where you would put C13 or N15, okay? And in order to do the labeling, you're going to put in five labels. But depending upon where you put them, you can end up with a 126 ion if you put, I have another slide that'll show you where. But the idea is you're gonna put them in different places so that you, you have different uh, labeling capability, okay? Now, because I told you at the very beginning you could tell the difference between N15 and C13, right? If you have high enough resolution, you can uh, separate and you can get 10 different things, okay? And that is all gonna go back to whether there was a label on this nitrogen or uh, carb, uh, C13 in this position, okay? So now this slide, it's harder to see, but the, the dots show you where the labels are for each of the different reagents, okay? All right, and then uh, the things here colored in black correspond to the reagents that are uh, for TMT6. The additional things in red uh, are the uh, extra channels that you use for TMT10. Okay. Unfortunately, it's a little bit complicated. Okay. So you have some impurities that, will, that you have to deal with uh, in this uh, thing. And there are two types of impurities. Okay. One sort of an impurity comes from, from how, how pure is the C13 that you start to put in the label. Okay. You can get over 99% pure C13 to incorporate these days, but it, there's some level of impurity. The same is true of, of nitrogen 15. Okay. But there's a second set of uh, uh, impurity, which is, this is in the unlabeled positions, okay? So this is over here, there's these carbons over here that are naturally occurring levels of C13, okay? And so if you end up with a C13 in one of these positions, it's gonna be one uh, uh, carbon higher uh, in mass than it would be, okay? So if you, uh, w when you obtain the reagents, they also give you a set of correction factors, okay, that software will apply to correct the intensities to account for the impurities present in the label, okay? If you obtain data from some public repository and you want to reprocess it all from scratch, make sure you get the correction factors uh, that are provided by the people who generated the data. Unfortunately, they don't always remember to give you the correction factors when they deposit the data somewhere, and you might have to send email asking for them, and hopefully someone can uh, uh, write back and give them to you. 
Okay? One of the things that we try to do from our lab is always provide these, um, but I often have to chase down the people who did the experiment and say, you need to provide these before we can uh, put the data in a public repository. Okay? Those correction factors are then used uh, with an algorithm to apply them uh, and correct the intensities. This is uh, a publication that's about 10 years old. This is, we use the same method uh, that they described. We don't, we don't use the exact same software because this publication is old enough that it only applied to iTrack 4. We've modified it uh, to be able to work with TMT6 and TMT10. Okay. All right, there's another sort of uh, set part of uh, complication in working with TMT quantitation, and that comes down to uh, interference, that, which goes back to if you fragment more than one thing at a time, okay? And so what I've tried to do is draw a cartoon uh, here to illustrate uh, how this works, okay? If you had two peptides of very similar precursor mass, uh, that were present at the same time, and let's say one of them is uninteresting. There's no, there's no, uh, no one of the six samples that has either up or down regulated levels of protein. But in the sample that's right next to it, it has up regulated levels of the red. Okay, so there's way more red in this one than there is in the other one. If you, you're using an older instrument, uh, you might have to set the precursor mass window to be two Daltons wide, which would cause both of these things to be transmitted at the same time, okay? The labels produce the same reporter ion masses, and you can't tell which one they came from, all right? So if you were to transmit this whole thing, then you would have a reporter ion uh, set that looked like this, only when the data came off the instrument, it wouldn't have this white line through, through it that allowed you to tell which one it was. You would just have the sum of these things, okay? If you were uh, able to use an instrument that had a narrow precursor window, then the, what information you would get would be just derived from this one peptide, okay? All right, so if you put the qu quantitation together uh, and, you're, and you combine these things, the ratio that you would calculate if you uh, calculated uh, the red divided by the uh, pink I'm sorry, uh, let's call that orange, uh, you would get a ratio of 2.5. If you had only the one together, you would get a ratio of four, okay? So the ratio of four is what you wanted to observe, but it is compressed to 2.5 because of this effect, okay? All right, so if you, so this is, this is just an example of what might happen, okay? And so that there's a couple of things you can do to deal with this, right? The first is you could do a better experiment, right? Uh, if you have an uh, instrument that allows you to uh, do better transmission. This, all of the CPTAC work that uh, is gonna be presented later uh, in the week and is already published is all iTrack data run on a QExactive uh, instrument uh, that at the time had a window of two Daltons for precursor transmission. What you can now routinely do on a Lumos instrument or a QExactive HFX is run a 0.7 uh, MZ tolerance uh, or window width, and so you would be able to, in this kind of case, transmit only the one thing, okay? The second thing you could do is you could have data analysis that would go back and look at all your MS scans and say, ah, if we've got this thing, let's throw away that data point, okay? And because we're expecting most of our proteins to be detected by multiple peptides, we have some way of, of taking and recognizing that some data points are better than others, and so we can exclude those, okay? So a common uh, thing to do, it, different people do this, but they don't all call it the same thing, uh, which is to take some measure of whether, how many things are, are here, and what's the relative abundance of those things that are there, and when the relative abundance of those things is, is high, then you throw away the data point, okay? Now that's an approximation, uh, because although I have shown you in this cartoon example that the ratios of the MS1 peaks is the same as the relative ratios of the, M uh, the reporter ions, that's not always what act actually happens, okay? When an individual peptide fragments, uh, you're gonna get some reporter ion signal and some sequence ion signal. But sometimes the balance is like this, sometimes it's like that, okay? And so even if this uh, peak right here in the MS1 scan is taller, 
It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to contribute more reporter ion signal. Okay? All right, so that's some of the uncertainty that's present in this type of data. Uh, and getting better at this is uh, there's room for improving our data analysis. Okay. All right. All right. Scoring peptide spectrum matches. All right. All right. So um, this slide I already showed you once. It was several uh, equipment failures earlier. All right. But the idea is that you're going to take a sequence database uh, and your experimental spectrum. You uh, have programs that are going to approximate what the spectrum uh, is expected to look like and then score them. These are some examples of some names of uh, programs that do this. Okay. Uh, if you are going to design a, a, an algorithm to do this, these are the kinds of things that you would have to think about. Okay. And when you, when you start to dis look at other, th uh, other programs, these are some of the things that you could you could think about in, in terms of evaluating or reading about what they do, right? So, but they're all going to, one way or another, have to deal with these kinds of things, okay? So there is going to have to be some step. Maybe it's not within the search program itself. It might be a program that you can run ahead of time that will do peak detection, okay? And it's going to do these kinds of things. It's going to do de-isotoping. Uh, it's, uh, it could assign fragment charge and do some sort of signal to noise uh, processing so that you're hopefully uh, trying to only use a signal uh, peaks. All right? You have to have, uh, when you design the algorithm, know what fragment ion types are possible. Okay? And when you uh, start to use a program, you often have to choose what instrument type it what is that you use to generate that spectrum. And when you've done that, it's going to, behind the scenes, be consulting a configuration file that's got appropriate things like what ion types are possible for that instrument and, some po and potentially some different scoring um, values for the different ion types. Okay? All right. Well, um, then when your algorithm also, not only does it have mass information, it has intensity information. Today, search programs generally make not very much use of intensity other than to say present and not present. Okay. All right. With the, some of the uh, machine learning approaches that are starting to be Im uh, imposed, uh, one of the goals of those is to, to make better use of intensity information. Okay. All right. You're going to have to choose uh, some uh, fragment tolerance units. Okay. I told you the resolution was uh, uh, different across the mass range in, in uh, s certain instruments. That is particularly true in orbit traps and time of flight instruments. The mass accuracy is also different across the, measure, uh, across the uh, mass range. And so we use different units. If you use a parts per million unit, a typical value of a good mass accuracy on a high res instrument ought to be uh, plus or minus five parts per million. Okay? And, and, the, and you would say that across the entire mass range. But when you convert that parts per million into Daltons, that means it's a wider mass, I'm sorry, wider mass window at high mass and a narrower mass window in Daltons at low mass. Okay? So if your instrument data has your mass accuracy specifically in units of PPM, ideally you would like to use a search program that can also support mass accuracy in PPM units. Okay? But it is actually quite common to use a program where it only has Dalton mass accuracy. And so what you have to do is compromise and set the, the uh, tolerance to only use the high mass one when you should be able to, uh, in principle, use it at lower mass and have a narrower tolerance. Okay? All right. Um, most search engines produce a score that is the primary score that's used to make most of the decisions. But along the way, they might calculate extra things. And that might be possible to use in, uh, in reducing your list to the confidently assigned uh, peptides. OK. Uh, some scoring systems are going to be dependent upon the size of the database. Others are going to be only uh, dependent upon the, the scoring of the ions and a, and a particular sequence. And if you take that sequence and put it in a big database or a little database, the score is going to be the same. Okay. Some uh, search engines will, however, take the size of the database into account. All right. 
So, uh, so that's what you have to do if you're designing an algorithm, you consider all those things. If you're going to use one, you uh, have to consider these kinds of things. Okay? You have to choose a database. Okay? Um, most of the time we're t today, we're g there's also an opportunity to, choose to somehow do a decoy database that is used to calculate false discovery rate. Okay? <clears throat> As you read literature, you will find that there are certain, certain groups that always uh, allow for partial enzyme specificity, okay? while other people will, uh, may require that uh, fully specific. So the trypsin had to cleave on both ends of the peptide. Okay? If you're using a partial enzyme specificity, uh, that increases the search space that the spectra are going to be matched against. The program is going to run slower, uh, and you usually have to have higher uh, score thresholds to meet your uh, FDR. Okay? Um, when you're going to choose uh, fixed and variable, variable modifications, you want to choose uh, things that you can expect to find in your sample. And if you are interested in these things that are rare, especially if you choose many of them, it's going to slow down the search. And I have a slide that uh, a little bit we'll talk about expansion of search space. Okay. Uh, then you have to choose, pre uh, uh, like I said, precursor ion tolerance uh, and fragment ion tolerance. Okay. All right. This is, this is how the uh, spectrum is scored uh, in my software called SpectraMill. Right? And uh, this up here is shown with the all of the peaks that are present in the spectrum as it's generated from the instrument. The instrument doesn't have it colored blue, red, and green, though. It's all black. Okay. All right. There's a pre-processing step that does peak detection, that does these, three, these several things, uh, de-isotoping, signal noise thresholding, removes the parent malignant neutral peaks. So these are the only peaks that are left that are, that are subject to the scoring. Okay. The scoring has three components to it. There is an, uh, uh, a, a, a positive component that means you, you, the mass matches a fragment, uh, fragment ion type. That match, the score of that is independent of the intensity, but it is weighted by what ion type it is. Okay? There is a uh, bonus for having composition information like ammonium ions, and then there is a negative portion of the score that is for peaks that are not assigned. Okay, and so basically a, a, a tall peak in a spectrum that's unassigned, that's bad, right? That suggests that you have an incorrect interpretation or you've got multiple things that are being fragmented at the same time, okay? The different ion types uh, have different scores. B and Y have the highest score. They have score of one. Uh, things that are B minus water, y, my minus water, A ions, those give you less information about the sequence be that because you've already got information from the presence of B and Y ions. So the A ions, B, I B minus water, B minus uh, ammonia, they score less, they score a half. Okay. All right, so you do all of those things and you end up with a score. In this particular case, the score is 12. The peak detection will produce no more than 25 peaks. The maximum score is 25. Okay. All right. Now, something that's uh, quite a bit more different and less intuitive uh, is, is something like a, one of these scores that is use a probability-based approach, and this is the binomial um, probability uh, equation. Uh, it is the basis for scoring in the Andromeda search engine that's part of MaxQuant. This, uh, roughly the same approach is used in Mascot. Um, and the way this works is that all ion types are given the same weight, okay? And in order to calculate the probability, you have to uh, account for the chance of there being a randomly matched peak, okay? And the way that this is put into the uh, binomial probability essentially comes down to breaking up the mass range into 100, I mean, 100 Dalton chunks. And you say, if, if we're going to look for, say, six peaks, then the chance of, six, of randomly matching would be 6 out of 100. Okay? It may not be immediately obvious, but that also suggests that the mass tolerance you are allowing was plus or minus a half a Dalton. Okay? All right. Now, in practice, MaxQuant has allowed you to specify a fragment ion tolerance, okay? uh, but that is not used as part of the scoring. Okay? 
And for up until about one or two years ago, Mascot did not allow you to use parts per million as a fragment tolerance. You had to use Dalton's, okay? And it's because of the way that the scoring is built into the probability, okay? So from, from my point of view, the, the probability is not true probability, but the scores are still effective, okay? And the reason that the probability is not true are for the reasons that I've uh, listed here and I've already uh, talked through, okay? All right. Now what I want to do to, to show you here is a contrast in this is what you would do if you knew what that peptide fragmentation was going to look like. Okay? And you would know what the spectrum is going to look like because you already had uh, a spectrum that you trust and you, is used as the reference, presumably because you knew you had the peptide, maybe you made it synthetically, generate a spectrum, that spectrum becomes put in a library, and then all the experimental spectrum you generate, you just match to the library. Okay. The particular case that I'm showing actually is one of these things where somebody is trying to demonstrate that the uh, thing that they observed in a complicated experiment, they made the synthetic peptide, the spectrum looks almost the same, you can calculate a spectral similarity metric, uh, and it passes the threshold, and they can say, see, we, this is what we said it was. Okay? All right. Um, so the, the equation that that's gets used here is a dot product score. There are a few different variations on this. Um, and I'm not going to go through the math, but the, the point is that you're really taking advantage of the intensities, and you're not allowing for all possible fragment ion types that could occur to a peptide. You're only allowing for the ones that actually occurred uh, to generate the, the reference spectrum. Okay? So uh, software programs that do this kind of spectral library search are listed right here. Okay? The uh, FDR method that's calculated uh, is sort of today not thought of as being as statistically rigorous as what is used for database searching uh, and as I would characterize that as a work in progress to be able to do good false discovery rate calculations, okay? Now it's also the case that in order to do this effectively, you have to have a good set of reference spectra to match to, okay? And one of the things we found in our lab is that uh, once we've got just a good uh, uh, reference library, somebody came up with a new chemical labeling agent and we switched it over it and they all, they fragment all differently and now we have to uh, start over, okay? All right, but after we've done a lot of work, somebody can collect all of our spectra and then use that as the basis for creating a library, all right? All right, um, now let's talk a little bit about uh, localizing and post-translational modification sites. Oh. All right, so uh, what I've got here is a MSMS -MS spectrum of a phosphopeptide. This is not two spectra. This is one spectrum. It's just labeled two different ways, okay? The same, you can see it's the same peptide sequence. Uh, hold on. That. All right, and... The only difference is whether the phosphocyte is on this serine or the phosphocyte is on this threonine. I want you to raise your hand if you think it's on the threonine. Now I want you to raise your hand if it's on the serine. You have to pick one. Come on. Go. Okay, serine? Okay, who else wants to go serine? Anybody who doesn't vote doesn't get the lunch coupon tomorrow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So the answer is yes, there's a serine, okay? And you should have been able to vote, okay? Because you don't have to know anything to, to see that when you look at the labeling, there's something that's not assigned here, and it is assigned here, okay? All right, but let's talk about what is assigned and why, okay? So the fundamental premise is of being able to pick where the thing is, is you have to have fragmentation between the possibilities, all right? So in this case, you have this single ion right here in the spectrum, which can be interpreted as the Y7 ion for cleavage right there, where 101 would be the mass of threonine in its unmodified form, 167 is the mass of serine, which is 87, plus 80, which is the phosphate, okay? All right, 
So if you were instead to allow um, 87 for the threonine, or for the serine, that would stick this in here in a sort of messy part of the spectrum, and then uh, it, the gap out here would be shown as this ion to this ion, and then that would leave that unexplained. Okay? All right. But because those two residues are right next to each other, you're not going to get much information to work with in order to make your decision. Okay, so in cases like this, and in all, it's going to be often the case that if you have to determine two choices that are right next to each other, you're going to have to make that decision on maybe one or two peaks in the spectrum. Okay? All right, let's, let's talk about the range of possibilities now that could happen here. Okay? Um, if you have, if you're looking for phosphorylation sites, the precursor mass is 80 Daltons higher, so, so you know you've got uh, phosphate. And then you look at the sequence. Can any, what's going on? Uh, what's here? Okay. All right. If you look at that sequence, there's only one serine, three anion, or tyrosine in it. So you don't even need to look at the mass spectrum to figure out which one is labeled or which, which uh, is phosphorylated. It's going to be that one. All right. Okay. I am having. I'm going to switch to the pointer here. Okay. Um, it takes a lot of time to figure that back to get in the red spot on the thing, so I'm just going to switch. Okay. So in this case, you will have a peptide sequence where you have a serine or a threonine, and so you could, if you have enough information, you could confidently say that the phosphate is on the serine, and we would call that a 99% chance of being correct. Okay. Let's suppose here you have one phosphate, and it could be on any of these three serines out here, if you have fragmentation between them, you can tell the difference. Okay, and I'm going to show you a spectrum where there is fragmentation between serines two and three, so we can say it's not on serine three, but we can't tell the difference between first and second serine. Okay? When you get multiple phosphocytes in the same peptide, that gets a bit trickier, and this is illustrating all the possible places, the combinations that you could put them, and then I'm going to show you a spectrum that gives you the ability to tell that there has to be a, one on this serine, not on that threonine, but then the second one we can't tell uh, where it is. Okay? So this is how complicated this kind of stuff gets. And when you are doing proteogenomic work and you want to look at the phospho data set and you look at the list and you're like, there's all these things in this list that don't have clear assignments of the serine threonine. Well, that's a feature of the data that you've got to deal with. One of the ways you might deal with is throw out everything that's not confidently uh, indicated to a particular position. Okay. Here are the spectra uh, that give you the cases that I just described. Okay. So here is uh, a spectrum where we can confidently put the phosphate on the uh, serine, and these ions in the spectrum, Y5, 6, and 7, are separated by the right uh, masses. Oh, I, they should have been labeled. Okay. Uh, this is going to be a 113 gap. This is going to be a 167 gap, and then uh, 97. Okay. So that can place the phosphate on that serine, not on that threonine. This gap over here is going to be 101. Okay. Here's the example where uh, the Y13 ion, Y13 doubly charged, right here allows us to fragment between the second and third serine. So we know that the third serine now is not phosphorylated, but there is no fragmentation between the first two. Okay? So we can't tell where that is. All right, here's the complicated one where there is two phosphorylation sites. The precursor mass is 160 greater than the unmodified version for this uh, sequence. We have <coughs> a fragment ion uh, Y9 and 10. That gap there is 187, uh, which is going to say that that's phosphoserine. And then Y5 and 9, here there's not very good fragmentation between those. And so uh, we can't tell where the localization is. Okay? All right. So when you're going to write some, so I tried to, to show you graphically, this is when you look at the spectrum, can you have the information? If you're going to write a program to do this, Right? These are some of the things that you got to put into the design of your experiment. You've got to think about all of these things. Okay? I think the most important of those things are shown here. 
the, the choice about how you decide what peaks are going to be used to make your decision, and then how do you clearly represent the certainty or un, uh, ambiguity in the localization decisions that the program has made. Okay? There will be different choices made by people that, uh, who write the programs about how to deal with the, the rest of these issues. Okay? And then uh, today, there is not a universally applied uh, way of determining a false localization rate from these scoring things. Whereas the target decoy uh, calculation for identification is practiced throughout the field. Okay? All right. This is how one, uh, one, uh, one of the first automated scoring approaches, and it is again using this binomial, binomial, uh, binomial probability theorem. But instead of using uh, the calculation based on all the possible fragmentation uh, of the peptide, it's limited to just the fragmentation between the sites that you're trying to distinguish which have the localization. Okay? But otherwise, it uses the same framework, uh, the same um, mass accuracy assumptions. Um, and when you get down to the, what your score threshold you're going to use, it comes down to essentially saying that we're going to, there has to be two good peaks that meet the scoring threshold. Okay? At the time that this was published, the authors used a, a particular score threshold. I forget exactly what the value was. Uh, and then, like a year or two later, they decided they could, they could say they have more identifications if they made the threshold lower. Okay? And it was essentially by saying, instead of two peaks, you would allow one peak to make the decision. Okay? All right, but you have this nice uh, uh, descriptive way of uh, using a mathematical calculation. Okay. When I wrote the uh, calculation, I've tried to think of it more intuitively, and um, I calculate the score difference in the identification scores given various possible places, and the decisions I made were on the quality of the information that gave those score distinctions. Okay. I said that I want the ion type that you allow to make the decision has to be one of the, the highest information ion types. It's got to be a B or a Y ion. You're not going to make the decision based on one ion that's a B minus water ion. You're also not going to make the decision based on uh, a tiny little peak that could be mistaken for noise. Okay? So what I sought to do is say that it's going to be a B or Y ion, and the relative intensity has to be at least 10% of the base peak. So it's a solid uh, peak. It's not noise. That works out to giving you a score threshold that's of 1.1. In conclusion, we hope that this lecture and the series of five lectures so far has helped you to appreciate the importance of sample preparation for mass spectrometry based identification of peptides, the need for enrichment of post translationally modified forms of peptide prior to MS analysis. The lecture has also provided you the glimpse of how impurities in the sample can lead to the errors during the identification of peptides. And additionally, you were introduced to the concepts of PSMs and how a specific software like a Spectrum Mill uses PSM to score the hits. Lastly, you were explained the concepts of phosphoside localization and scoring using suitable examples. In the next lecture, Dr. Carl Clauser will conduct hands-on sessions to help you interpret the MSMS spectra manually. Thank you.